Thank you so much for that very informative presentation. So, um, and just as a point of fact, uh, watching you in Forks Over Knives is the reason why I became plant-based. So I really appreciate <laughs> your So um, you went over where, you know, your books and um, do you have a, like a website that you recommend people go to check out your, your you know, your work or uh, on, uh, you know, any sort of social media, anything yes. like that? Center for Nutrition Studies, Center for Nutrition Studies dot org. I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, that's, that's the title. Of, not, no, it's, it's called Nutrition Studies dot org. Nutrition Studies dot org. OK, perfect. Thank you very much for sharing that. And now we're going to begin our Q&A. Um, we'll, you know, I'll be asking. Can, can I take one break just for two minutes? Absolutely. OK, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, and while he's taking a break, um, I will share my screen real quickly. Uh, actually, you know, I'm going to hold off, but uh, I'll share my screen. But I do want to point out the fact that um, that you can go to our website for a lot of really uh, informative information about the various presenters that we have. Uh, we have. Um, one, the schedule for the, for the conference that includes, um, you know, all, all of the, uh, you know, all of the speakers. We also have bios on all the speakers, so you can learn more about uh, each individual speakers, as well as you can go to the website and you can um, check out uh, the books that uh, that the various uh, that the various presenters have. Um, we have not, you know, not just their latest books, but we have multiple books of theirs. Um, and then as well, and, and this is, this is great because, uh, you know, this is a, you know, a free online 17 day conference. And obviously it's very difficult to, uh, to sit and, and, uh, you know, you have other things to do. It's very difficult to, to sit and, and watch all 12 and a half hours of, of each day. So, uh, we have the videos the following day that they were presented. We have the videos that uh, you can go watch from the previous days so you can, you know, not miss out on uh, on these wonderful presentations. Well, welcome back. Thank you so much. Do you go by Colin? Is that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure I got that correct. So now we're going to begin our, our Q&A. And uh, we're going to, I'm going to ask some questions and then we'll also turn it over to the audience to ask some questions. And I just want to inform the audience of what they they need to do. Um, so real quickly, we don't take questions directly from the chat. Well, the, what we ask the audience to do is to click on the reactions button second from the uh, right at the bottom of the Zoom window. And then you'll click on uh, raise the raise hand function in that, that menu pop up. And when I call on your name, I will unmute you and then prompt you to state where you're from and ask your question. And we just ask that your questions be brief and, and on topic. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and start with uh, with some questions here. So um, so in in the the China study, which was obviously you know a, a huge study um, conducted over I guess in the 70s and the 80s, um, do all, do the conclusions that you had come to uh, back then do, do, are they all are they all still the same, or have you learned more information that may change some of the conclusions from the China study? Yeah, they're basically the same. I mean, of course, as you know, that study was very different sort of design. Uh, it was all people it was located across the country. We call that an observational study comparing populations, if you will, of villages, which is different from other kinds of studies. You probably know that. Uh, so we took a while to analyze the China study. But what it showed was that on the question concerning protein, in China, they consume very little. This is before the data I just showed you this is back then. But what, what it showed is that as soon as animal food comes into the diet and all of its sort of indicators, if you will, that's when diseases start to occur. The different kind of diseases. The, the, of course, the Chinese die of something, obviously. Uh, they, they tend to die of uh, the, the, in those days, because this goes back to the, those days back to the 60s and so forth, they, they die of communicable diseases mostly communicable diseases, which we sort of dealt with ourselves in our population years ago, uh, infectious diseases, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, so, it, and 
and on the question because they're heart disease, cancer, so forth, so they were a fraction of what we had. That was in 19 data weeks, like in the early, well, it's two parts to the data available in the 1970s, actually. Uh, and then when we did it the second time, this is an update later, we saw the same thing when we combined Taiwan and mainland China. In other words, car starting to put animal food in a diet causes problems, whether it's osteoporosis, uh, that was a different kind of study, or whether it was you know heart disease or cancer and so forth. And uh, so, yeah, we that's what it was. And have there been follow-ups to the, to the China study to see just how the the increase in in animal products has contributed to cancer and all these other these other diseases? Yes, just- that's also had access to the Taiwanese data, which are a little more Western, uh, not too much, uh, but you know, this saw the same thing. We saw the same thing. It's uh, quite remarkable. Thank you. And what what are the your what are your current thoughts on the ideal level of cholesterol? I know you during your presentation you had mentioned that um, that it was more of an indicator as opposed to a cause, but. Um, what you know, there's a lot of talk of below 150 is is uh, is but you know is kind of heart attack proof, and then some people say that it should be high because we need it for brain function. So what are, what are your thoughts on, on that and its impact on health? Well, the level of cholesterol is an indication of lots of things sort of going wrong, if you will, largely mm-hmm. triggered by consuming animal food, not enough plant food. Obviously, they go together. So uh, we can talk about, about a lot of different things, but um, the 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 the, uh, the ideal levels, so-called ideal levels, are, are the sort of agreed upon levels uh, by a system that does not. They they look at it differently, so it's almost hard to answer this in a short sentence. Uh, sure. But when I first got involved in this with our study from China on cholesterol, for example, uh, the average cholesterol in China was for the whole study was 126. That that was considered to be dangerous territory in the West. So the idea of the levels in the West was, uh, as you know, you know, they said if you went below 160, we'd be in trouble. And they named two specific things based on an isolated study here and there. One is we have a higher rate of suicide, so it was said. And we have, have a higher rate of colon cancer. That was nonsense. That was nonsense. It was taken out of context. And, and they, they would say that uh, the we could be as high as 300 level of cholesterol. You know, we're, we're living in the Western country, more cholesterol. In China, they're down to 120, as I say, 126. At first, I could not believe it myself. So we had it analyzed in two more laboratories, one in England, one in China, one in my own lab. And the person I was working with is a gentleman who was the director of the Framingham study at the time. He couldn't quite believe it either. It was that low because it was, we just sort of generally believe it's too low, it's risky. It's so totally untrue. Your question, what do we do? Do we take the range typical that we see in China and go with that? Or do we take the range that goes in the West? That becomes a little bit political to say the least, I have to say. Uh, so I don't know what the, to me, the range is just as low as you can, whatever is consistent. I happen to have cholesterol quite frankly high by those standards that I just mentioned. I'm around 170, 180, which is not too bad, but that's what it is. Um, and uh, that in turn triggered another consideration I learned about. Some of us have higher than normal levels, even if we do everything right, largely because of our being nursed or not nursed when we were infants. If we nurse, and that, that came out of a study out of Iowa and some other studies we did in our lab, it came out of this idea that when, uh, if we start out a, a baby on mother's milk, that's got cholesterol. That programs us for, you know, the, the rest of the, the deal. And so at the beginning, this one study I'm thinking of, the babies had a little higher cholesterol levels than those who were on infant formula made out of soy. And so, oh, you know, soy, that's soy's good. Well, what happened six, seven years later from those infants, seven years later, the ones on the mother's milk said to be high. It really wasn't high. It was it was like you know one two, uh, uh, one uh, one ten. Uh, anyhow, that it gradually increases the age up until about uh, one forty seven years later. 
The others that were on the lower level looked good at the time. And after seven years, it went up to 170. So one started at 98, only going to 140. The others starting out with uh, uh, you know, 110, they went all up to one, you know, I said reverse. In other words, the programming in the beginning. So we did some animal studies on that too. Our, our bodies, you know, consuming the right food at the right time, namely mother's milk. It, it, that's part of the activity of the body sure, adjusting itself for future, you know, future health. And so uh, it's, we end up with high cholesterol levels because we eat all the wrong food. And right. uh, I, I was not nursed. I had some kind of allergy. So I ended up at a higher level than our kids who you know, were down around, uh, you know, 120. And uh, so, but that, that's what it was. And just as a follow up to the cholesterol question, given that you you mentioned that um, that cholesterol is really an indicator an indicator as opposed to you know causal agent, does lowering cholesterol um, artificially through the use of statins, for example, does that actually um, extend extend life or produce health? No, I know that's a very sensitive political topic. I must tell you. Uh, I told that to one of your one of the this conference here, here that you have about four or five years ago. Kim Williams here beside me. I made a comment. Kim is the head of the heart of cardiology. He said, "No, I got this here. I got that." And so he showed a couple of studies that showed, yeah, it does have some effect. Uh, I've looked at all of them that I can. Maybe it has a little bit of effect in reducing the risk, but it's so tiny, not compared to something like what Esselton does or what Orange does. No comparison. And so uh, that's why I say it's uh, still a little bit uh, contentious at the present time, but uh, yeah, it's little or nothing. And it has all these side effects. <laughs> I, I remember that interaction with, with Dr. Williams, as a matter of fact. So um, so our first question from, from the audience is, is going to be coming from Bex. Bex, please state where you're from and ask your question. Yes. Hello. I'm jogging, so I'm going to go to a walk so I don't sound like I'm huffing and puffing. But uh, thank you, doctor. You are a pioneer and we all appreciate you. I think that's safe to say that uh, that resonates around the world. My question is, how do you get across to people, even if you cite studies, but like you said, some of the doctors in the peer reviews, they don't want to read it. They don't want to look at it. They're in denial. How do you deal with these types of situations? Thank you. That is a first class question. I, I have to tell you, it's, a, it's one that's really bothered me a great deal, uh, particularly since the pandemic started, um, because there they were denying, once again, any role for nutrition when there's a very strong effect. And I, I had the data to have it. They didn't even want to review it. I, and you're asking me, how do you deal with that, I, I guess? Um, and and this this kind of trend has been going on for many years. To be honest about it, nutrition been denied have anything to do with heart disease and cancer and so forth and so on for all that time. Primarily because they're considering nutrition to be a function of one nutrient at a time and one target, and they like to keep drugs. That is drilled in our heads so much from the policy level at the national level, if you will, all the way through schooling, and it's become. Just a common knowledge. I, I, that's why I said it's, it's a it's, uh, unconscious denial of what might be the truth. Um, and I, I'm actually writing another book right now, just about done, on just exactly this question. Why have we gotten in such a rut, you know, collectively across the nation, across the world, with this idea of denying what can work and what can't work? I will tell you in sh just really briefly what the problem is. Reduction of science, where you can one thing at a time, it sells, it makes money, okay? Nutrition does not, it's that simple. I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm, I'm sure that some people are gonna get annoyed with me for saying this, but at our government level, and I was intensively involved in some of the policy development things years ago for about 20, 25 years. Um, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, they're protecting the livestock industry. The Department of Health and Human Services are protecting the pharmaceutical industry. So we can, the, the, the agriculture department lets us eat the wrong food, in fact, encourages it. We get sick, more patients. 
The other department is sitting there ready, ready to go with drugs. Lyndon Johnson knew that way back in 1969, and a, a thing that was never published at the time, when he was speaking to some CEOs of the pharmaceutical industry. So I, I really had, I have to say, a lot of experience at the policy level, this was the laboratory level, and speaking to medical schools to see this unfold. And it, it is very sad, and it's a, quite frankly, it's scary. Because what is happening now, and in in during that time, uh, especially since 1971 until the present time, they took away the one instrument that I had, a lot of my colleagues didn't, and that was uh, uh, academic freedom. Universities are supposed to be places where you can go speak your mind, and you don't get fired because if you say something that's not popular. I had academic freedom from the time I was in my early 30s, quite young. So I had the benefit of saying what I feel like saying. <laughs> I have to tell you, now that's almost gone. It was diced and sliced from in a formal study from a formal analysis from 1980 to 2010 when the Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, was passed. In other words, there are forces in our society. I know this is terribly contentious, but there are forces, large forces in our society that basically control the information we get on health so they can protect the industries that are making money. That's the shorthand. And so I, I, I'm open to whatever anyone else can add to the argument, disagree with me, disagree with me if they like, but we've got to deal with that question. Who's, who's providing the information to the public? I say this program right here, I'll put a plug in for this program just, just for that reason alone too, reaching out to get opinions going. We don't have this that often enough these days. And so there you have it. I, I could talk all day long and night on this subject, but I'm really very upset because I have seen what has happened during the pandemic uh, play out over years. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll say it anyhow because I, I say what I believe, but uh, I did not get the vaccine. And people thought it was crazy, especially at my age, my wife or myself. And then we just, we lost our minds. Well, I was based on you know what I knew about biology, about biochemistry, about virology, as a matter of fact. So we were along, and finally we got tested positive. It was just last October. No problem. We didn't get sick. We didn't have fever. We didn't have any headaches. A little bit of coughing went on for just doing a little bit of flu-like symptoms for six eight days. That was it. Wow. Um, so. I'm, people don't like me say that, you know, that I'm shooting my mouth off on it and I have no reason to do that, supposedly. But, you know, it's part of my story. Mm -hmm.